And good morning, good day to you all. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today. My name is Johanna. I'm from the UN Innovation Network. We've recently had a lot of new colleagues join. So if this is your first time with us today, a very warm welcome. And um, welcome to our little community of innovators or innovation enthusiasts from across the UN. It's good to have you. And we're glad to welcome all of you today to this two-part webinar series on data visualization. In the first session today, we're going to talk about data visualization per se. And in the second one on Thursday, at the same time, we'll discuss design principles and also learn some magic tricks for designing really powerful graphics. And of course, this like, data and data visualization is important because we're so surrounded by data. Um, and it really can and should inform our decision making in all areas of the UN's work. Um, and that could be, you know, ranging from leading where we prioritize uh, humanitarian assistance after a disaster to planning our supplies, to negotiating carbon emissions, to measuring employee wellness, there's no area in the UN's work that could not be better informed by data. And of course, one person who knows that more than anyone else is the Secretary General himself, and he really understands the importance of using data and new approaches and is encouraging us to do so. And for that reason, he's launched, um, was correct, the data strategy last year, and that, as you can see on the previous slide, is a strategy for action by everyone, everywhere. So there's an expectation that we all engage with data because on the next slide you can see his quote it adds value to our operating organizations and the people we serve so we all need to get better at using and presenting and interpreting data and we hope that this webinar series um, will help with some of these parts so we'll focus on presenting data in such a way that it becomes usable and easy to interpret and really inspires action and good decision making so very excited to be here um, before I hand over to our presenters, I want to get a little bit of a sense of who's on the webinar today. And those of you who join more frequently, you will know that we like to do polls here to keep it interactive. So launching the first one today, and we would like to know from you, do you work with data in your day-to-day -day job? And then once you've answered that, you'll see there's a second poll coming up. How often do you need to visualize data in your work? And when we were prepping with our presenters, I had a bet that there should not be a single person who says never. I'm obviously going to lose that now because someone says it's going to say never. But let's see. We'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Take a pick. Okay. So here we go. And you should be able to see now that do you work with data in your day-to-day -day job? 64% of you are saying all the time, 31% sometimes. So that's really the vast majority saying data is a critical part of your job. And then looking at visualization, interesting, 30% saying you need to visualize it daily, super interesting, 50% weekly. So also the vast majority. So clearly data is super important. And we're glad that you've joined us uh, to learn how we can do it best and better. So um, before I hand over to pr uh, presenters, just a quick point that we are going to take questions throughout this webinar, and we're taking them in the Q&A box on your screen. On the next slide, you can see where this box is. Um, we ask you to put your questions in there, not in the chat. It helps us keep track, it allows us to prioritize, and it allows you to vote and tell us which ones are most important to you. And because it tends to be the most popular question. The webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available afterwards in our webinar library and we'll also share it with you via email. Right, and now you've really heard enough from me and it's my pleasure to introduce you to two of our three presenters today. Uh, we have three colleagues and um, data visualization lovers from OCHA joining us today. We have um, Akiko Harayama, uh, she's a consultant at OCHA's Center for the Humanitarian Data. And we have Joel Opuletzia, Information Management Officer with Data. And we'll shortly be joined by Javier Cueto, who's the Head of Design and Multimedia, also at OCHA. And of course, as you can see on the slide, these are only their official titles. Their real ones are much cooler. And the three of them are going to take us on a journey to help us become better at visualizing and facilitating decision making. So, Joel. Joel, over to you for the first half of this webinar. You are on mute, Joel. Just uh, checking off the unmute. Uh, thank you, Joanna, uh, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are happy uh, to see a lot of people joining this webinar. Um, as you can see from uh, this slide, there, are, there will be three people on this panel, uh, Akiko, 
uh, he used to be my boss and Javier, who is my present boss. So I'm kind of just like stuck in the middle and I just do everything they ask me to do. So that's my job. So that's why I'm speaking first. Um, so today we're gonna be uh, talking about uh, ways in ways to represent data in a very efficient and simple way. Um, this is just a collection of tips and guidelines that we have uh, collected over the years. We've seen um, that, that, that seem to work over time as well. So these are guidelines, not rules. Um, some people may think they're rules, but if you're good enough, sometimes these rules can be broken. And I know you come from different uh, organizations. You may have your own guidelines. Um, I'm hoping that the tips that we share uh, are similar to what you guys have, or, uh, or even you will learn something new. And if you do have some question that kind of goes opposite to what I'm talking about, please feel free to put it in the Q&A se uh, section of this uh, webinar, okay? So I'm gonna start. Uh, so the webinar is gonna be uh, separated into three sections. I'm gonna talk about uh, simple charts, and then if we have time, some advanced charting, and then the third section is the types of tools we use to make our visualizations. Great. So simple charts. So the very first thing I would like to talk about is uh, text. Uh, now, this is usually an overlooked way of representing data, uh, but text is usually the first thing that I look at when I want to show key figures. So let's say for this example, there are 483 aid workers that were attacked in 2019. Okay, so if you take out the image, uh, the background image, you can see that it's just a very simple way to adjust the text by the style and by color and by the size. And you basically have a very useful data visualization. Okay. And now if you um, use iconography, and this is a, a set of uh, icons that Ocha has developed uh, recently called the Humanitarian Icons version two. Uh, which is available on our new branding site, brand.unoj.org. So if you do that uh, combination between key figures and icons, you can develop a very uh, good infographic. And this next example uh, shows this. Now, this is, was done entirely in PowerPoint. And as you can see with the key figures over here and with uh, an associated um, icon, it shows some great information in a very simple slide. Now, this is what I, I wanna stress with everyone who's on this webinar, that anyone can make a good infographic if you follow uh, certain guidelines, certain tips that we're gonna share today. And as you said before, this was done entirely in PowerPoint. And some of the things that we will be showing you will be done in Word or PowerPoint. So everyone uh, can, is, it's easily accessible to everyone. So the next type of uh, way to represent data is the common table. Okay, now everyone uses tables on a pretty much, uh, you know, every day, every day, everyone uses a table, okay? So this is the type of table or infographic that Akiko used to do before we met, okay? And this was many, many years ago. Uh, and I'm just, we're, we're just using uh, some data, present day data, okay? So I had to take, a, uh, I had to uh, sit her down a bit and uh, talk to her about some of these guidelines that uh, we follow at, at Ocha. And, uh, and as you can see, she was not really impressed with my a uh, discussion with her at first. But uh, showing her some step-by-step -step, uh, tips, uh, I got her to understand um, the basic uh, good uh, design principles of making a good table. So 
The first thing uh, we like to do after you make sure that your data is good and clean is to sort your data, okay? So in this case, we're sorting the data by cumulative cases over here. After that, we want to simplify the table. So we're going to remove the fill colors. So they're a little jarring to me anyways. So I'm going to remove the fill colors, all right? And also, we're going to simplify it even more. We're going to remove all the grid lines and the borders. And now the data is up front, up front and center. All right, we're going to do some layout a bit. We're going to left align some of the text here. You can see that the countries are left aligned now. And we're going to right align the numbers. And this is best practice anytime you're using figures. Always right align your numbers. Okay. And now we're going to align the titles with the data. Okay. And then we're going to resize the columns to the data and add space in between the data columns so you can read the information better. All right? So we're almost there. So these are very simple steps. And this was all done in PowerPoint. Now we're going to add some separating lines every three to four rows, depending on how much data you have. So this makes it a lot easier to read um, your data in row form, OK? So every row, you can easily read now. And now we round the numbers, right? And then we make the numbers a little bit more meaningful and add some, we add a thousand separator. So it's a little bit more digestible to everyone. And then we will also want to change it to your corporate font. We all, most of us have some branding guidelines. So change your corporate and change the information to your corporate font. And then we want to emphasize a few elements. All right. So we bold the title and we sometimes simplify the title as well. So this is the final table. And as you can see, it's drastically different, but it only took a few steps to make it a lot better than it was at the beginning. Okay, so that is the table. So the bar chart, this is the most common infographic. Um, so we're gonna start a poll now. And my question is, when would you use a horizontal bar chart over a vertical one? So we're gonna give you guys a few seconds to answer this. I think 30 seconds would be good, have you? I, Joelle, I always try and get to something like 75% of responses to oh. make the data meaningful. Oh. We're currently at 60, so a little nudge, everyone. If you haven't voted yet, tell us what you think. And it's not a quiz, there's no grading. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. So ending this poll here, and I'm going to show you the results now. So you should be able to see now the most popular answer of almost 50% of people saying to show a time series trend. And then we have 35% saying we have long category labels and a few colleagues saying you have data with extreme values. Okay, so we're, we're almost there. So the correct answer is actually B. So it is when you have long category labels. And I will explain that to you in the next few slides why, okay? All right, let's get back to it. So when you want to use a vertical bar chart, there are a couple of instances when this would be a good idea. The first instance is when using a time series. So basically a years or months. And the time series is uh, usually organized from left to right. So it follows the natural sequence of reading, all right, from left to right. It's a little bit more difficult. It's not impossible, but it's a little bit more difficult to read the pro progress when it's from the top to bottom, as you can see in this slide. Right. You can also use it for ordinal variables. And when I talk about ordinal variables, I'm talking about uh, categories that follow an order like age group, all right? So from zero to 17, 35 to 54, and so on and so on. Again, they are easier 
to process by reading from left to right. And again, it is a little bit more difficult to read this type of uh, data set from top to bottom. It's not impossible, but our job as, visualiz as visualizers is to make it easier for the reader to understand the data. Okay. Now, uh, with ordinal variables, um, sometimes uh, it's okay uh, to use um, a horizontal when the category la labels are too long. So for example, uh, country names, or in this case, like a, a survey result. So it's okay to display uh, this type of information as a horizontal bar chart. Now for a horizontal bar chart, there's a couple of uh, um, ideal situations as well. So usually uh, I like to use a horizontal bar chart when I am displaying uh, country names, because some of those country names are very long, okay? And uh, I see still some people who like to use vertical bar charts for this. It's not uh, impossible to do, but again, our job is to make it a little easier for uh, the user to read it. So if you look on the right-hand example here, when we use a vertical chart and the country name is slightly angled, you know, I'm going to tilt my head a little bit like that. I know it's not much, but I want to avoid that. Okay. So again, if you're using, if your data set has a, has a long uh, labels, long names, try and use a horizontal bar chart instead. Okay. So I'm going to go through some of the basics of what makes a good chart. All right. So first, always make sure that you have a clear and concise title that usually has um, the units in it, uh, the location of where it's happening. I see in a lot of publications still where there's a graph and there's no title. So I have no idea what this graph is supposed to be. Another key element for a good chart is to make sure that there is a source and, and uh, also if there's a date to that source. So this is vital, especially working for the UN. We have to always put the source of our data, all right? And in this instance, for a vertical bar chart, always start the axis at zero, no exceptions. Try not to uh, cut it off. Don't start at 20, don't start at 100, don't start at 1,000. If you uh, think you need to do, do it that way, then you have to either change it change the values into percentages or use a different type of bar chart, okay? Okay, and here's another example. So you can see that there's a lot of values in the millions here. If there is a value that's under a million, it's okay to use a K for a thousand. So you can change the denominations. So you can go billion, million, uh, thousands if you need to. All right, and the last thing is, uh, all right, so the last thing is to, um, when you only have one data category, uh, you should um, not have legend because you have the direct labeling here already. There was one point that I almost forgot actually. So when you use these uh, vertical bar charts, sometimes, um, you will have your values here. Um, you, you, will, you will have your X values here. It's always good to make sure that you simplify the data. Um, so the January, February, March, if for instance, that uh, there's no space, sometimes you create subsets. So you only uh, label January, March, May. So every other um, section. Okay, now here's a, a, an example of a vertical bar chart, another one. So the first point here is to, you can simplify the numbers if they're very large, okay? And you round them up. So there's 2 million, 1.5 million. There's no need to put two and then six zeros right next to the figure, okay? 
if there's no room to actually do any direct labeling, this is when you can add these discrete gray lines. All right. So you, you can see exactly, well, kind of where the data points fall. All right. And then number three is direct labeling of values eliminates the need for grid lines. All right. Uh, so next one is, sorry, number three, sorry. So the, the horizontal labeling, uh, you try and do it whenever possible. And again, avoid rotating the, la the labels. We don't want the user to tilt their head, remember? Okay. And again, I want to say if space is limited, label a subset like every other month. And if the category names are long, maybe you want to use a horizontal bar instead. Now, the horizontal bar chart, some of the things that we look out for here are um, make sure uh, that you avoid using acronyms, okay? For the category labels, remember to sort your data either from highest to lowest or lowest to highest, depending on the key message that you want to convey. Um, this is a good way, when you sort your data, this is good for your readers. Um, this allows them to easily compare the data values and to have an overview of the wide range of values if you do have them. Okay. And again, direct labeling of values eliminates the need for grid lines, while rounding is done to make the values easy to digest. Now let's talk about a stacked bar chart. So a stacked bar chart is there to compare totals and be able to see their breakdowns. We usually use this type of chart when we're talking about funding. Okay. Excuse me. So again, some of the key elements in making a good stack bar chart are, we want to, we want to sort the data by the total. So in this case, we're going from highest to lowest. So we're sorting everything uh, based on this 2.4 billion, okay? Legend, now this is a very important uh, part of this chart. So the legend should be situated at the top so the reader knows exactly what they are uh, digesting when they're looking at this chart. And one of the key things that you have to do with the legend is the order of the elements should follow the same sequence as in the chart. So what I mean about that is that you wouldn't want to put the non-funded part of the legend in front of the blue funded area. So you have to make sure that it's in the right air, um, the, the right sequence. Okay. Uh, we recommend to use stack bar charts with no more than two categories. If you have more than two categories, it becomes a little hard to compare. Okay. It's the, in, some, in some instances, it can be done, but we would advise uh, to only use two categories. Okay. And number four, avoid using acronyms or jargon, okay? If the name cannot fit into two lines, use an acronym and then add a little asterisk and add the full spelled out version in the footnote below. Okay. And we're gonna now talk about the 100% stack bar chart. So it's very similar to the stack bar chart, but this helps to analyze the breakdown a little bit better in a more clear way, okay? So the 100% stack bar chart shows the relationship of individual categories of, uh, to the whole in percentage. The total is always 100%. Now with a regular stack bar chart, it's hard to analyze the breakdown, such as the amount of funding. For example, it's not possible to see the breakdown um, for sectors with small requirements. Okay, so yeah. And I think that's it for my part. I'm going to hand over to uh, my dear uh, colleague, Akiko. And I haven't been checking uh, the Q&A. Hopefully there's been some questions and I will 
let you go, Kiko. Thank you. Yes. But before Hadi, um, is there any question and answer that uh, we would like to go through right now uh, based on um, Joy's presentation? Um, hi, sorry, I'm, I was late. <laughs> I'm happy to, to be here with you. Um, so I was late, but you gave me a lot of work and I've been uh, answering your questions on the q and I don't think we need to cover any of them uh, uh, openly now, uh, but maybe at the end of the session. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Javi. So I learned so much from uh, Joel. And um, now that I'm expert in data visualization, when Javi joined, this is what I got from him. So similar to um, Joel, my first reaction was, we need to talk about that infographic you made. I don't really know what he was thinking of, but, but he was looking at me in a strange way. So this is what I um, taught him. Uh, when you do a line chart, um, so line chart is used to show a time series trends, and it's very commonly used and uh, very useful um, to show trends. So um, there are some best practices to follow. So on the y axis, we recommend to use natural increments, meaning that it's dividable by one, two, or five. So in this case, we show dividable by five. Sometimes you see a graph that has like three, six, um, nine, 12. So those breakdown is not very reader friendly. So try to avoid that and use something that, that dividable by one, two or five. Then uh, the line has to be thick enough so that you can really see the trend. And um, this is the difference between line chart and um, bar chart. Line chart, you don't always need to start from zero because the goal is to show a trend. So uh, in that case, we started from zero because in January 2020, the number of uh, cases, COVID cases was uh, close to zero. But let's say that we would like to show the trend for 2021, we could easily start from a 35 million rather than zero. So that's the main difference between bar chart and line chart. Um, and if you have only single line, like this case, you don't need to have um, a legend. Uh, the, just the title will suffice to understand what you are showing on the graph. And lastly, um, Joy has already mentioned about uh, not tilting. So the date format, uh, make sure that it's user friendly. I saw sometimes some technical chart that show uh, 2020 12 07. So depending on the region you are coming from, the date format might change. 12.07 might be December 7 or July uh, 12. So make sure that you make um, a data format that is um, available for everyone. The question of hiding or showing points. Um, so you can add point to you when you would like to highlight some specific points. So on the left side, we are trying to show the cumulative number by month. So we added a point um, uh, for each month. On the right side, uh, we are using the data of uh, cumulative uh, by week. But you can see that we, if we add the point to all the week, um, you cannot see the line. Actually, you don't see the trends. So it's overwhelming. So in that case, don't add the point. Just uh, leave it as a line. So it's kind of um, uh, balancing out between the line and the point. In case you want to show multiple lines um, to have um, comparison, you want to do, uh, have a contrast between the different data series, um, we recommend to not have more than four lines. Um, it's all depending on the data set you have. For example, you can have six um, different series that doesn't overlap too much. Then actually, yes, it is fine. But when you start to do more than four lines, just think about it. Is it readable for everyone? Yes or no? So um, a tip is, for example, you can merge uh, to other regions in that case, um, because the other region was uh, very low. So you just merge into one. That way, um, you can still see um, four lines. When you're labeling, try to make the labels close to the line as much as possible, not on the top like um, it was uh, for the bar chart, the stack bar chart that Joy has shown. The reason, if you put on the top, you have to go back and forth between the top and bottom. So you're losing a little bit of time to try to understand the chart. 
So if the ladder can be as close as possible to the line, that's the best way to do. And um, for the colors, um, we are using uh, four different colors so that you can really see distinctly uh, those four uh, regions. If you try to use tint, like on the right side, um, depending of the screen resolution you have, or also the quality of the screen, or even when you print, um, maybe it starts to be quite difficult to differentiate the lines. Um, so we recommend to use uh, distinct colors for the line chart. And uh, this is an example if you try to show more than four lines. Um, on the left side, you can see that uh, we need to add two extra colors to show Africa and West Pacific. So it starts to be a lot of colors. Um, and also we have problem with uh, placing the labels. It starts to be a bit um, stuck to each other. So difficult. The more lines you have, the more difficult it will be to read. But there are cases like on the right side when the focus is only in one series. In this example, it's on Americas. You can actually add more lines because we are using the other lines like a background uh, information and not the focus um, uh, on the chart. So always depending on your cases, um, four line is not a rule to not break. So, uh, the case when you have more than four, what we recommend to do is to use a small multiples, meaning that you're going to try to break down instead of trying to stack everything in a one single chart, you break down into a small multiple chart. So now you can see that um, all the regions easily because they are following the same scale and um, it's easily comparable as well. So best practices here, um, try to simplify as much as possible. In that case, we just added the minimum value and the maximum value. Then uh, we also sorted the data from the highest total to the smallest total. That way um, uh, it's easily comparable. We saw in a, some of the Q&A, some people were saying that ah, sometimes country you cannot sort um, because um, there will be more uh, political uh, side. So in that case, yes, um, you don't need to sort from the highest to the lowest uh, total. You can always do alphabetical. You can still compare because they have always the same scale and the same size. The question is, um, should we have always the same Y axis? Um, the answer will be, it's all depend on the context and the messaging uh, you have and the analysis you like to make. So if the goal is to compare between regions. Um, in that case, keep the same y uh, axis scale because you try to compare one region to other. So in that case, you can see that, well, Americas, they have really higher um, uh, values while uh, West Pacific and Africa and Eastern Mediterranean, they are lowest. So you can compare between regions. If the goal um, is to see the trends within one re region, then, you have to adjust the y axis scale depending on the data of each region. So now you can see, for example, West Pacific, um, you have a different peak that in the previous slide, uh, you could uh, not really see because it was the number of cases was so low that you couldn't see the, this pattern. So by changing the y axis scale, you can see um, the pattern now. So depending on what you like to achieve um, and your audiences, you can adjust or keep the y-axis. Uh, I would like to mention that now, thanks to the digital era, the good thing is you can also give this option to the user to choose. So you can add a toggle button and saying uh, you want to change the uh, x, y axis or keep the same skill. That way, depending on the audience, you have the choice to, to, to do your own analysis. So pie charts. See, this is a popular choices, but also the most controversial. Um, many designer like me, <laughs> we're gonna say I avoid pie chart, but we know that many people love pie chart because it's also yummy. <laughs> and and um, it's also, I think it's been there for a long time. So everyone kind of know how to read the pie chart. But the reason as a designer I'm uh, recommending not to use the pie chart is because it takes a lot of space to show little information. And um, 
it's quite difficult to start to compare the sizes because we are comparing surface um, and not the length like the bar chart. Uh, I will show some example later on. And the slides can vary the size depending on the data, but, but most of the time you won't have space to add the, the label in the slice. So you need a legend. So when you have a legend, you have to go back and forth between the legend and the, the slice, making it difficult to, to read. So we didn't do the poll here, but um, when you try to look at the comparison from Southeast Asia uh, and Europe, for example, the first thing you have to do is trying to see which uh, slices belong to Europe and um, Southeast Asia. So you have to go back and forth between the legion and the, the, the pie, right? And then you try to look which one is bigger. We know that it's sorted, so one, which one is bigger, but it's not easy to compare. So there are a lot of back and forth and movements um, to, in order to analyze. Well, if you look at the bar chart, it's so simple, it's very stressful word, and you can really see the differences. Um, so when you do the, um, with the legend, uh, let me say if you really want to insist to use a pie chart, those are the best practices. Avoid more than five slices because it, it becomes really hard to read. So you can always uh, merge into others, uh, the last category as the others. Please make sure that the sum uh, adapts to 100%. Then sort the data from the largest to smallest. And always start with the 12 o'clock. And the legend, actually, you can see that uh, we have used the tint and not different colors. Uh, the reason is because as we sorted the data, there is a sequence, a natural sequence. So you don't need to add many colors, just uh, use the tint and make sure that the legend order is the same than the pie chart order, the slice order. If you do direct labeling, uh, you can actually remove the um, legend um, because you have already the labels there. But now you can see that uh, it's not really balanced. Uh, left side is very heavy, on the right side is not. So it's become a bit complex. And every time the data change, you might need to readjust the placement. So that's why pie chart is not an um, uh, easy solution. And in that case, you don't even need to add the colors or you can add colors when you would like to highlight one element. Don't use 3D data, uh, 3D effect, or trying to use multiple pie charts for comparison. It's already hard to read one pie chart, um, so it's making it even more difficult if you add some effect or multiple pie chart. So don't add chart. Um, difference with uh, pie chart is like you have a space in the middle to add text, so maybe it's easier to make some uh, label. We usually recommend to use for binary data. Binary data meaning yes or no, funded or uh, unfunded. Of course, you can add more data if you want, but the more uh, breakdown you have, the more difficult it will be to read um, and to place the, the labeling. So conscious of time, I'm gonna go quickly actually in the advanced chart. Um, so surface area is to compare the size of a bubble. Uh, you can use for maps, uh, you can or you can also use as a simple chart like that. But we are recommending to use for communication purpose uh, only. So here it's kind of nice and you can read because there is the numbers inside. However, if there is no um, labeling uh, inside, same as a pie chart, you can see that it's very difficult to compare the sizes because again, we are comparing the surface and not the length. And again, like the pie chart, if you look at the bar chart, it's so easier to, to do analysis. So bar chart, you cannot never get wrong with the bar chart. So you can almost use bar chart for everything. Bubble chart is very, very powerful data visualization um, to present multiple variables. So you can look here, the first variable here is on the X axis you have the number of total cases. On the y-axis, we have the total death, so second variables. You can use different size for the bubble, showing a third variable. So for example, we used the uh, last week number of cases. So the bigger meaning you have more cases the past uh, 
week, uh, the smaller, um, uh, less cases. Um, four variables, you can divide up into a region. So we use different colors for different regions. And even fifth variables, which is the time, if it's for online digital, you can add a timeline slider so in play button um, showing the time um, and it's going to move and animate to show the, the time differences. So very powerful. But it's not actually simple to read. Um, so be careful. Think about your audiences. If they are advanced people that, that are familiar with this type of um, uh, chart, yes, you can make it. But sometimes for some people, it might be too complex to, to read. Matrices, similar to bubble chart, um, you can also show a lot of information into a condensed space. Um, so matrix is used for category. So this is chart showing number of organizations working uh, in Ethiopia uh, in different regions uh, by sector. So for example, you can easily see that um, water sanitation hygiene in Somali has a lot of organization working there. But education, um, there is only one organization working in Somali, that's it. So maybe um, you can really see quickly a lot of information in a condensed way. Again, not everyone will be familiar to read and it might take some time to understand the chart. Uh, so don't always use, think about your audiences. Sparkline, um, it's similar to the uh, small multiples. Um, you can add with key figures, so that way you can see the time series and not just uh, like the key figure that show only one point of a, of a time. It's very powerful. And lastly, illustration um, is give uh, a good context. This is the cases when there was an earthquake in Philippines and a tsunami wave was reported to range from three to six meters in height. So if by just adding a small um, icon of person, you will say, wow, okay, three meter and six meter is really high. So it's give you a, a good context um, by adding illustrations. So, um, there are some questions now we have kind of learned each individual chart the best practices um, so we did the decision trees um, for you to help you to decide which chart you like to um, use for uh, which cases um, uh, as i said bar chart you can never get wrong you can use for almost all cases but if you want to uh, do variation we added this tree so that um, the powerpoint will be also available you can look more closely i'm not gonna go to details but you can see if it's for compare value or show trends doing analysis communication purpose want to show part of a whole then um you you can use this um this is in trees so now i'm passing um to javi thank you akiko before i start with this part um we have a few questions so one of them is about your favorite chart the pie chart that by the way in french is camembert chart so that, that's why it's uh, so low because it's uh, either a pie or cheese um so a couple of questions about the, about the pie chart akiko let's hope you can answer this when will you use a pie chart if at all what cases it's recommended to use a pie chart <laughs> so that's why myself, I have more tendency to use donor charts um, um, to show funded, unfunded, um, something like that, and always binary data. And pie chart, I almost never use. I use only for um, mostly bar charts. Um, but I know that some clients, depending on clients, uh, recent cases, they say, I really want to show the pie chart so that you can show um, as a, a whole part of a whole. So if the client requests, yes, I'm going to do it. But myself, if I have the choice, I wouldn't use a pie chart. Um, or are you going to use a um, uh, donor chart for binary data? But for those cases that you, it is OK to use a pie chart, uh, Akiko, correct me if I'm wrong, because you are the expert, but it's when we want to represent a, a total how a total number is divided in several parts. Am I right, Akiko? Is that the right explanation? 
Yes, and also you have to make sure that the data is not uh, overlapping. There, there is a kind of differences in um, in the data, so that not all slices are, are too too close together. Um, so in that case, yes. Um, but again, even if you want to show part of a whole, but you can also break down um, into bar chart. It's also correct. Um, so as we say. You have a choice. You can use bar chart or pie chart. Um, and uh, if you follow the uh, guidance we have provided on best practices, yes, there are some cases you can definitely use pie chart. Okay, thank you so much. Another question about pie charts. And you mentioned a bit of the best practices about the how to organize the data on a pie chart. How we should always start at twelve o'clock, and then we go uh, with the bigger uh section uh, there was a question uh, about uh, the 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 um, if you recommend to use the second bigger to put the second bigger at the top left there are some guidance somewhere that uh, uh, we yes. know akiko uh and that, <laughs> that, that question can come up so please uh, tell us so i'm sure the person who said that is <laughs> an advanced uh designer so um before we when we did training we're recommending that actually the best option uh we we put the um, highest uh value on the right side at 12 o'clock but then the second largest has to be on the left top and you you go con uh, counter clockwise the reason is because um uh, you will learn on the next uh, session on thursday that uh normally we read from the top to bottom so meaning that on the top you have to have the most um, important information on the top um, and in the case when you sort out from um, the largest to smallest clockwise what we we say the main major problem would be the smallest amount which is the others um, maybe you can put the next slide oh. uh, no, sorry, on the pie chart, uh, where we show, yes, this one. Uh -huh. So the, not the, after, after, uh, with the direct labeling, yeah. Pie chart with the direct, direct labeling. This one? No, okay, don't worry. <laughs> so when you have uh, the pie chart with the di direct uh, labeling, next one. Uh, here you go. Yes, you see that the first information you're gonna get is the others which is not actually the point of a pie chart you want to show the uh, largest which is america and then it's followed by south e e east asia but technically to do that way to sort out um, the second larger from the left side it requires some advanced uh, technique so that's why we didn't mention um the 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 other best practices because we didn't know we are mixed audiences today, uh, but yes, there is another way to do the, um, the pie chart that we used to, to say, depending on the audiences. <laughs> Thank you, Akiko. We can is... add actually, yeah. yes, we can add this slide to the, um, uh, the, best, the other best practices to the slide when we're sharing. It. Perfect. Thank you so much. So there is a, another interesting question that we actually had a, a little uh, debate internally in the group that is about capitalization. Should we capitalize labels? So we use a sentence case. Should the M or the K be the same size of the figure? Um, so I, I can answer this one. Uh, actually, we, we uh, Joel and Akiko, please uh, uh, complete if, uh, if you see that is necessary. But I don't think there is a, a rule set in a stone. It depends on the style guide of your organization. So in, in Ocha, for instance, we have a, a, a style guide that say that uh, headings should be this way with like, uh, this type of uh, uppercase or lowercase and labels should be that way. So it will depend on your organization style guide. I don't think any of them is wrong or right. Regarding the M or the K for the millions or thousands, um, if they should be the same size of the figure or not, uh, I know Akiko and Joel loves to make it. Uh, they love to make it smaller. I am. Um, I prefer to make it uh, the same uh, high because I'm a bit obsessed with typography and I, I feel that there is too much contrast. It doesn't really matter 
as long as the, the figure and the number is clear and the information passes. And one thing is also its consistency. Um, if you try to make um, uh, uppercase in one area, make sure that it's consistent um, towards um, the infographic or the work you are doing. Yeah. So the most important is make sure that there is consistency. Yes, very good point. So I know we have a couple of other questions, but let me cover this one the data visualization tools and software that we use or we recommend. That's the million dollar question and it was in the Q&A and everyone, uh, we are all a bit obsessed with software and with uh, what tools are the good tools, what should we use. Uh, the short hour answer is that it doesn't really matter. So uh, you can use any tool, any software that you have available. Uh, as long as the information, as long as you follow the process of data visualization that we are actually going to cover in more detail in the next session on Thursday, as long as you follow this uh, thinking process and the graphic, the data that you are visualizing is clear and understandable uh, to your audience, it doesn't really matter the tool that you use. You can be doing it by hand uh, or painting and if it works, and there are a lot of very nice data visualization uh, handmade that works. Uh, just, but to go into what we do, uh, we mostly use Adobe Illustrator. So if you're familiar with Adobe Illustrator, it's a great tool to produce uh, vectors and graphics. The chart tool that is in Adobe Illustrator is pretty bad. They, uh, it hasn't been updated, uh, I think in uh, 10 years. I don't know why. But we recently found this plugin called Datilon. It's there on the presentation. And it's actually great. It's, it integrates perfectly with Adobe Illustrator and change, changes completely this chart tool. So I it's not free, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's cheap. And we actually have a UN discount. So uh, let me know if you're interested and I can put you in touch with them. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is a great tool. Then, of course, the Microsoft uh, tools, uh, Microsoft Office tools that we all at the UN have access to, they are also uh, correct to create uh, charts and to visualize data in PowerPoint, in Excel. Uh, they're getting better and better, so you can also use those. And then we, the more and more we're using interactive uh, tools to represent data, especially real-time data like Power BI and Tableau. They are both quite intuitive. And uh, I think little by little those are taking over. And we've seen more, many of those in uh, all this COVID statistics and uh, data visualization. So those are more or less what we use. Then there are mm, hundreds of tools and I'm sure you know many of them. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are web-based, other you download the programs, for others is a, a JavaScript library, or uh, I even tried to learn uh, 20 times uh, Python to visualize data. It's impossible for me. I'm sure in the audience, we have some Python experts that can visualize data in a super impressive way. Um, there is one tool that I recommend you, you check it out. It's free. Uh, it's called uh, Road Graphs. Uh, so you type roadgraphs.io, uh, you go to a web-based uh, tool where you can just uh, uh, copy paste your data and you have different options to, to visualize it and to download it as a vector, as a SVG, and also as a PNG. And uh, the, there's one of the, the charts that we love that is the alluvial chart. And it works very well to, to represent the flow of information, the flow of data. In this case, for instance, is uh, the displacement of people. So from a point A to a point B, we can see clearly uh, the, the, the amount of people that uh, move from one side to another. It works pretty well also with uh, funding. So if you need to represent um, donors and recipients, the amount of money that goes from one side to another, this is a, a great tool. It's free, very easy to use, so check it out. Um, it's uh, called roadgraphs.io. Uh, and uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it was great. I think we still have five minutes for questions, but don't forget to check out the websites brand.unocha.org and data.humdata.org slash database. Uh, 
uh, guide. So both of them are connected, so you will find links from one uh, to another. Thank you, Javier. And let me come back in here and first of all say thank you to you guys for an informative and really entertaining presentation. I think it's not just me when I say that I've enjoyed the humor as well as the learning elements. So really well done, you guys. Um, I also want to just say, because I've, I've seen the question about 10 times already, we are going to share the recording and we are going to share the slides. So it will be delivered straight to your inbox. You don't need to do anything um, except give us a few hours to process it. Um, I have some questions in here that I do want to take, but I also want to pick up on some of the ones that Javier, you've answered already, because I think they might be interesting to other colleagues as well. And I think there was one around, is there a document that summarizes all this guidance? You've shared a lot of tips for, for specific for certain types of charts. Is there a single place where we can find this guidance summarized? So uh, I'm going to respond to that. It's actually in those uh, uh, two websites you can find all this information and more templates guidance uh, video tutorials and we are constantly updating them we actually uh, published them recently so it's still not as it full uh, capacity but in the coming months uh, you'll have a lot of uh, resources there to learn about data visualization to use our template everything is public domain use it change it uh, change the colors adapt it to your organization uh, it's uh, all yours Fantastic. That's good to know. And we'll make sure to include those resources in the standout as well. Um, I also want to take this question here from Nada. And they're wondering, um, is there any particular training that you can recommend for Power BI or extending the question for other tools specifically? Um, and I think it ties back to another question we previously had around hands-on exercises. So what would you recommend doing there? And so all three of you. For uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, go first if you want to add Sofia Kiko Joel. Uh, so for Power BI, actually, we just finished um, a very basic tutorial about how to create a, a, a how to make a simple dashboard in English and French, and it's going to be posted on our brand site. I uh, we are not sure yet if it will be available for everyone or for only OCHA staff. Sorry, but we need to deal with some uh, permission issues. But otherwise, there is a, a UN wide Power BI uh, group, if I'm not wrong, because I received the newsletter and they have events and they have a, a site in ISIC with a lot of resources. So, uh, search in ISIC uh, Power BI, they have a lot of uh, super interesting tutorials and information. And also, uh, you will see in our brand uh, site, uh, uh, you'll find it somewhere. There is a link to uh, to the to LinkedIn Learning. So, with your un.org um, email, you have free access to LinkedIn Learning, and there are a lot of tutorials for Power BI. And it's a fantastic tool and quite um, intuitive. And we have some templates there, so use them. Thank you, Javier. If you could send that to me, then I will include that also in the send out. And I'm selfishly going to take one last question before I let you guys go, because I'm really interested in the answer myself. I have a gut feel, but I would like it to see if I was right. And uh, a colleague is wondering, when do we use italics and charts? Kiko, Joel, for you. <laughs> So here is the same than um, the uppercase, lowercase. Uh, we have different opinions as, among us as well. <laughs> for example, Javi, he used uh, italics um, uh, for, the, for some titles. Um, and me, when I was a uh, day boss, I say, no, never use italic. Uh, my um, uh, explanation was it's like the same than when you do um, a bar chart and you have to tilt your your head. So to me, I tell it you have to tilt maybe just like that. <laughs> but, uh, so it's not as smooth as um, when you don't use italic. But again, um, as we say, this is some recommendation tips. Uh, it's not um, depending on the situation. You can use italic, um, but. Myself, I would say try to avoid if you don't need to use italic, don't use it. Or I'm sometimes using for when I want to do a source. Um, so I'm adding the source uh, in italic. But in the main um, chart itself, I avoid italic. But maybe Javi will be saying something different. So um, depending on the person, if it's 
um, easy to read and everyone can understand easily, that's fine to use italic. Um, but if you have too many data with italics everywhere, maybe think about it. Um, maybe it's better to not use italic. So if I can complete uh, the answer. So uh, I agree with Akiko that all depends on the style of your organization. So uh, for certain organizations have a very strict um, uh, style guide and you use italic only if you are referring to a title of a book or some, things like that. Um, and there are a lot of books on typography with different opinions, different options. For me, I think that the, the different weights or the different uh, variation of a font help you to create hierarchy, help you to create different levels of information. And italics is one of those. So if you have everything in a regular, but there is an information that refers to something special, you can make it special with, with different techniques. It could be italic, it could be the different color, it could be different size. And we're going to talk about that in the next session. Ah, what a fantastic segue. Joe, go please, please go ahead. Uh, I just noticed that uh, someone, it was a very old boss of ours, asked if we still do maps. Uh, yes, we do maps. And in, uh, in talking about italics, uh, it's a little different with maps. There are certain things that are part of a cartographic principle, let's say. So when you do water features and stuff like that, that should always be in a tablet form. So that's just a little add in as well. Thank you and greetings to the old boss. Thanks for joining us. And with that, I am uh, I'm realizing we're over time, we have a million questions left. I think maybe what we should do is try and first of all, invite everyone back. Please join us again on Thursday when we take this to the next level, same time, 9 a.m. Um, I posted the link in the chat so you can use that and we'll also include it in the send out email. So do join us. And maybe Akiko, uh, Joel and Javier, we think about adding, I don't know, a 15 minute uh, Q&A period at the end so that we can try and cover more questions because I'm seeing a lot of very interesting ones. Um, unfortunately, today is not the time, but do come back on Thursday and we'll make sure there's plenty of time um, to help you with, with your data visualization needs. And with that, I'm going to say thanks to the three of you. What a fantastic session. I've laughed a lot and I've learned a lot. These are the best kinds of webinars. So really, thank you so much for joining us today. And very excited to see you on Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. See you Bye. Thursday.